Right, hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. You can personalize your fueling and hydration strategy so you perform at your best with 15% off your first order of electrolytes and carbohydrate fuel with the code OXYGEN24 at PrecisionFuelAndHydration.com. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Coach Rob Wilby, and I'm joined by Coach Chris Palferman. Chris, how are you doing today? Hello, Rob. I'm very well, thank you. Great to have you with us again, man. Every week, we bring you an episode of this podcast to help motivate and inspire you for your triathlon activities this year. There's a couple of things you can do for us, please. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, please follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you like this episode, it really helps us reach new athletes and it helps us help new athletes, essentially. Really helps more than you know. And the second thing you can do is, if you're looking for help and advice with your triathlon training this year, please get in touch. There's a link in the show notes, or you can email help at oxygenatic.com, and I'll give you those links again at the end of the show. All right, so on this week's episode, we were, we were very lucky this week. We were trusted by the organizers of Ironman Wales to deliver a webinar for them, um, helping their athletes train. We're, we're seven or eight months away from Ironman Wales at the moment as we're recording, and we laid out the way that we would advise people to train for Ironman Wales. And at the end of the webinar session, we had a Q and A where people could ask any of the questions that they had. We had over 200 people join us live and there were 600 registered for it who got the replay. So if you're one of those, thanks very much. And thank you for all the people who sent emails afterwards, thanking us, it was very much appreciated. What I thought we would do today is we would answer the questions that came up during that episode, we had over 20 questions people asked, and, and it was really interesting, the range of questions. Some of them I, I expected, and some of them were, were ones I just thought, I never thought we'd have to ask a question like that. So Chris, our job today is, is to answer the questions of, of people. Some of them have got some experience. An awful lot of the people had, had never done an Ironman before. Some of them had never done a triathlon before. So that's the context to listen to this through. And I was surprised by how, I mean, I've been in the sport 20 odd years now. I was surprised by how much of the stuff I've forgotten that I didn't know back in the day without that meaning to sound arrogant. It's like, oh yeah, that, that really simple stuff around the very simple questions you have when you're starting out would never have thought to cover them in the webinar without people asking. So, so yeah, let's, let's jump right in and get started, shall we? Do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would just remind the listeners that this is all about Ironman Wales. So if you're doing a slightly different event, it's still applicable, but keep in mind that this is Ironman Wales. So Yeah. And I think what we should do, Chris, along the way, let's let's answer these questions relative to Ironman Wales and then where it's applicable, we'll expand the answer out to, you know, other Ironmans as well. And if I forget to do that, please remind me. Yeah. And I think that's quite poignant because Ironman Wales is such um of course, the word unique, maybe unique mm. course. It's very, it's got its own challenges and every Ironman's hard, but Ironman Wales is particularly difficult. It's also particularly special, but you need to get it right. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and it's worth anyone doing any Ironman considering what are the, the unique things about this race? Is it a is it a flat, fast bike course? Is it a really hilly bike course? Is it a sea swim or a lake swim? Is it a hilly marathon? Is it a flat marathon? And again, like you said, it's not, not about a flat bike course being easier because the feedback we get all the time is, you know, I, I went to whatever, Ironman Ra, uh, Challenge Roth or Ironman Austria thinking it was going to be easy because it would be five hours really fast on the bike. But holding the aero position for five hours is a struggle in itself. Whereas getting up out of the aero position to climb hills gives you a break from that position. So there are definite things along the way that I think the word easy and hard is, is misinforming people, isn't it? It's just different challenges, right? Really. So our first question comes from Sarah, um, and I'm going to post this one to you, Rob. What's the longest duration you would recommend we run off the bike in the longest brick? All right, so um, context for this is, we very much see brick runs in training as, as really having one purpose. And the purpose is mainly mental, not physical. And starting a brick run, your legs will very probably feel really horrible, really tired after, after a bike session. 
and you're not going to feel normal running. But that feeling passes within five to 10 minutes. And so the purpose of the brick run is to mentally deal with that feeling for the first 10 minutes and tell yourself that your legs will come back and running will feel normal again in five to 10 minutes time. So in that context, the length of the run off the bike isn't that important. It's the getting the brick runs done. We usually schedule these in the, the eight weeks leading up to a race and, and no sooner than that, because it's all about mentally learning that although your legs feel horrible off the bike, they're going to come back and you're going to feel good again. Now, to specifically answer that question, the longest brick run we schedule is 45 minutes off the bike, but it's not about so much building up the duration of that brick run. It's about the combination of the the bike and the run and maybe another run the next day and the things we put in training plans like that to really help the overall endurance and durability. The main purpose of that brick run is so that mentally by race day, you'll know that even though you feel awful coming off the bike, very probably your legs will come back. Right, Chris, next question for you. This question is from Ben S who says, this is my first Ironman event for Ironman Wales. A lot of people are suggesting it's a really tough first one to do. Is it a doable course for a first timer? Got to be careful how I answer this one. Yes, it's a very clear answer. And I'm going to say yes to the vast majority of people, but I'm going to caveat it. It's a big green yes, as long as you're not naive to the demands of the course. So the demands of Ironman, whichever course in the world, incredibly difficult and incredibly difficult to get right. That's the first point. Then when you put Ironman Wales on the top of the list, the, the swim's not flat. And that is a serious point. It's a very choppy sea swim. The bike is not flat, very hilly, very hard to find your rhythm, very hard to pace. And then the run also not flat. So it's basically a whole day of hills and you're combating the elements, the terrain, um, the weather's particularly not great in Wales on the best of times. And so you have to take all that into consideration. I still think the answer is yes, as long as you use this time between now and September really well. So being really specific to the demands of that race, and you don't want to turn up as feeling like a newbie on race day. If you feel like a newbie on race day, then I'd probably, for safety reasons, say this is probably not a good idea because you're going to be out there for an extremely long amount of time and it's incredibly hard. I've done this race. I did Ironman Wales and I can't quite remember the year, maybe 2018. And I'd already done four, five, or maybe even six Ironmans by then. And Ironman Wales hit me in the face like nothing else. And I'd prepared properly for it. I'd done a lot of um, riding in difficult conditions, running on hills, all the things that you'd expect. And Ironman Wales is still the race that I found the most difficult. It's also the race that brought me the most joy, happiness, satisfaction. I actually punched my Kona slot there as well. So it means a lot to me in that sense. Long story short, yes, do it. It's a very hard course, but it's also it's a dream course, the support you're going to get on it, the memories you're going to get from it, but you have to make sure that you prepare yourself. Don't turn up thinking, I'll just muscle through this one because I'm in Wales or we eat you alive if that's the case. Next question from you, mate. Um, so this is from Matthew. Any recommendations for Ironman Wales between a road bike versus a triathlon specific bike? Yeah, great question. And it's one we get a lot. So the answer to this is going to be what we tend to see is that people are faster on a tri bike as long as two key criteria are fit. The first one is that you are comfortable and confident riding your tri bike. And the second one is that you can deal with riding the tri bike over the kind of terrain that you're going to go and attempt this race on. And so the answer is going to be different for different people here. The nature of Ironman Wales means it's a very hilly, very hard, challenging technical course. And most 
beginners and newer triathletes find it harder to ride uphill and especially handle a bike downhill going on a TT bike as opposed to a tri bike, sorry, a TT bike as opposed to a road bike. The reason for that's really simple. The geometry of a road bike is more set up for you to be better handling going down hills faster. The TT bike is, the geometry is more set up for you to be going, if you like, fast in a straight line. So what we see with our pros and with our top age groupers, they spend an awful lot of time riding on the tri bike. They're very, very dialed in. They're usually very, very good bike handlers. It's no challenge for them going downhill on a TT bike. That very well might not be the case for you if, if you're a beginner or a relative newbie. So you need to ride the bike that you're most comfortable in. It might be a little bit slower on a kind of eggs to eggs basis on a road bike versus a tri bike. But if you can't handle going downhill on a tri bike and you have to use the brakes all the time and you're really scared and, and you know, if you're not confident going down the hills, that's going to cost you more time. So if you are going to use the tri bike, you have to be sure that you're really confident handling it. And you have to be sure that you've spent an awful lot of time on that bike in training to get used to the position. Okay, next question for you, Chris. Ricky says, we've talked about recovery being the most important day of the week. And we've talked about recovery being the most important week of a block. So what would a good recovery day or a good recovery block look like? So this is a, it's a massively leading question here, isn't it? But I think it's such a great question. What, would, what does good recovery look like in the context of training for Ironman? Yeah, I really like that recovery in this conversation is right at the forefront. It's not the thing that we tap on at the end. It's the thing that we build in at the start and then build the volume around that. Um, with our athletes, we tend to enforce at least one, what we'd call recovery day a week. And that recovery day can look slightly different for different people, depending on how much stress they've got in their lives, how much training they've done over the past five to seven days, um, and also genuinely how fatigued they are. So a recovery day, as it sounds, the main objective is recover. So for some for one athlete, that could mean doing absolutely nothing and staying off your feet as much as possible. For someone else, that could be a casual walk in the countryside with your dog. Absolutely brilliant. Um, there are also some athletes that have shown us that they bounce back better doing some very light recovery work. And in that sense, that could be a very, very easy swim. And that's not a swim where we're looking at hitting certain paces or particular reps, it's actually much more technique based and essentially keeping feel for the water and keeping mobile. So if you can keep that mobility flushing out your legs, your arms, your body, doing a 15, 20 minute swim for a lot of people, they might feel better. Again, that's for a certain type of athlete. For the majority of athletes listening to this, who are thinking, this is my first Ironman, I'm going to presume that you haven't done a huge body of work in terms of endurance training. If that's the case, I would urge you to have that recovery day as a pure day off training, switch off from triathlon, do something else, but recover as much as you can. So that means good nutrition, good hydration, trying to stay as stress-free as possible, healthy eating, lots of sleep, and just genuinely switching off, not being an athlete for one day of the week actually goes a really long way to you being a really good athlete on the day that we want you to be. In terms of a recovery week, what we do is we tend to cut the volume, cut the intensity for a period of seven days. And that tends to come between three and four weeks in a training block. And again, there, the focus is pure recovery. We're not looking to improve our fitness. We're looking to decrease our fatigue, which then has the knock-on effect of a positive spike in fitness. So again, a lot of athletes, when they're on their own, it's really hard to actually put a full week aside of, I'm not going to get stronger, fitter, faster. But the only way you do that is actually by stepping away. So that's how we, that's how we prioritize recovery as a general rule. Great answer. Next question, next question for you, Rob, is from Richard. 
And he's asking how many, what's the average hours per week over a 36 week period towards Ironman Wales? Yeah. And this 36 week period, I think it's, it's interesting and valid for, for the Ironman Wales audience at this point, because it's about 36 weeks to race day, but it's also great because I think it's the, if there is such a thing, it's the perfect number of weeks to train and focus for Ironman. Cause we've got like a 16 week winter FTP build block. And we've got a 20 week race specific build to your Ironman block. And they, they add together really nicely. The question of how many average hours a week is, the answer is honestly, it depends completely on the athlete. But what I'd say, and what we drew out in our webinar was, let's work out a way we can have a structure that you can repeat that structure every week. And across time, you can then start adding more volume into your training because the, the fitter you get, the more training you're going to be able to handle. So we started out by advising athletes to have four sessions a week, four key sessions where we look at two bikes, a swim and a run. And then if we've got time, we add in an extra bike, we add in an extra run, and that's got us training six times a week. Now, for our beginner athletes, it might be that 30 minutes a day is fine, but let's build to the point where we can train for an hour a day. And then let's build to the point where one of those sessions is a longer bike ride, and we build that session up towards three hours. And then let's build our longer run to the point where in the early phases, we build that run towards an hour, an hour 15. And then we're at the point where across a six day period, we're getting somewhere in the region of seven to nine hours a week of training done. If you can keep that rolling over a multiple week and multiple month program, you are going to get really, really fit. And it's a lot less about you know, how many hours can I hit in a given week and much more about what's the, the repeatable number of hours in a week that you can do week on, week off, week on, week off. In an ideal world, we'll move from that base point of training six days a week and about an hour a day. We'll add some extra little sessions in and we'll gradually extend our longest ride towards, you know, six, seven hours, the 180K mark. We'll extend our run up towards the three hour mark for people doing Ironman. And so our biggest week is going to be sitting somewhere around that 15 hour mark if everything gets done in that week. But again, it's much less about the number of hours that you do and more about what you prioritize in the hours that you've got. So the short answer is the number of hours a week doesn't matter, but let's get to the point where you can do some kind of training every day, have your recovery focused day and keep that pattern rolling week in, week out, month in, month out. That's the best way to get yourself to Ironman in a, in a great shape, ready to race. All right, mate. Next question from Sarah J. Do you recommend carrying salt tablets on race day? I love this question. Um, and I particularly like it because this particular athlete is already thinking about it. And that is such yeah. a positive step. You're not kind of, you're not going to be that athlete faffing around in the last week thinking, oh, electrolytes. I never even thought of that. It's brilliant that you're thinking about it now. It's a tricky question um, because everyone's so different when it comes to electrolyte losses um, and nutritional needs. But as a general rule, all the athletes tackling Ironman Wales will need to consider their electrolyte intake. So there are lots of different ways you can do that. The salt tabs is one very easy way, little tabs that you can literally swallow. So that doesn't take up a lot of space in the pockets, but there are also lots of other ways that you can do that, whether it's um, putting tablets into your water bottles, and then you can drink that throughout the day. There's lots of evidence that suggests that preloading before the event is uh, very beneficial. So the night before and the morning of, try and get your electrolytes on board. On the bike is an obvious place where um, getting as much electrolytes on as possible is going to be great. And then the run, which is usually a very um, sweaty affair for the majority of runners, that's where we're losing a lot of sodium. So the, I think this is a natural point where I could point you to the likes of Precision Fuel and Hydration. Go to their website, go on the Fuel Planner. They've got it all there available for you for free and start tapping away your case study and they'll spit you out some numbers. That's basically a really good starting point of how much 
um, sodium, potassium, magnesium you need for a long duration, such as Ironman Wales. And this one, you know, this subject's quite close to my heart. I did Ironman Mallorca, and I can't quite remember the year, maybe around 2015. And I did the big mistake of not respecting the electrolyte needs. And it became pretty dangerous. I had tingling in my fingers, in my forehead. I was incredibly disoriented. I didn't know which lap of the run I was on. I wasn't running straight anymore. And that all came down to my electrolytes. I didn't take enough on. So if we can share that experience for you, for you to say, oh, right, okay, it's not just about carbohydrates. That's really important. It's not just about fluids, but it's also about electrolytes. So make sure you educate yourselves. Start with the Precision Fuel and Hydration website, and there's lots of other good materials out there. And another point, just to wrap up on this, is it's scientifically shown that it takes on average eight to 10 weeks for an athlete to train their body and their gut to be able to consume and absorb the nutrition and hydration that you're asking it to. So if we use round numbers about 10 weeks where you want to be training your gut, between now and that 10 week block, you need to work out which products you're going to use, how you're going to carry them, the logistics of that. And then you can really practice in your race sim weekends. If you're one of our athletes, where we ask you to essentially be doing an Ironman over three days, that's the perfect time to practice and stress test ex exactly what your nutritional needs are. So long answer, but in essence, yes, look into electrolytes as much as possible. Yeah. hundred percent. I think it's a really good point for a word from our sponsors. Mm. Sorry, Rob, I think there's a slight delay, but here's a question from, uh, from Christopher. Having never done a sea swim, any open water venues that you guys could recommend in the South Wales region? Yeah, so we, we're not going to give any recommendations for individual coaches in South Wales, but I think this opens up a bigger question, and, and it's a great one. If you've entered an Ironman that's a sea swim and you've never done any swimming in the sea before, it's great news that you've got nine months until race day yet because getting into the sea in a safe environment to practice swimming in the sea is going to be a big, big part of your success come race day. Now, if we were having this conversation two weeks before race day, it would be a little bit more difficult. But right now, nine months away, it's not difficult at all. You need to find a way to get yourself into the sea and practice swimming in the sea safely, either an organized session or a sea beach that's got lifeguard cover. But salt water feels very different to swim in than fresh water does. So even if you've been swimming in the lake, it feels very different to swim in salt water, both in terms of the taste of it getting in your mouth or if it gets in your eyes, but also the amount of buoyancy that the salt water provides for you as well. It feels completely different. So you've got time to get yourself into the water. If you don't know of any sea swimming areas you can go to, my advice is just use Google and have a look around. Go to your local triathlon clubs in your areas and see what advice they've got for you in local specific areas. But if you work off these two bases, you'll be able to apply this advice to any Ironman at any point in the world. But we go back to this. Swimming in the sea is very different to swimming in fresh water, even if the sea is flat. And the chances are that come race day, it is not going to be flat in the sea. There's going to be at least some kind of rolling chop or swell in the water. And it will feel very different in the water to how it feels when you're standing and looking from outside of it. So Getting in before race day is going to be absolutely key to your success there. Right, Chris. Next question for you. Tom K says, what heart rate should my long rides and runs be? Good question. Um, as a general rule with our athletes, we try and use heart rate as a secondary metric on cycling, for example. So heart rate is brilliant and it, it does give an indication of what's going on, but because it's so variable, it's not the metric that we want to absolutely hold on to for everything. Heart rate can change due to 
outdoor temperature, air density, emotions, fatigue, stress, caffeine, just to give examples of all of the factors that can change your heart rate. So what we ask is that our athletes record heart rate so we can see what's going on, but actually be more guided by power. So as a general rule, we're looking for normalized power to be around the 65 to 70, maybe even 75 if it's an experienced athlete, but err on the side of lower is better in terms of the newer athlete. So in terms of heart rate, that's going to be around what the majority of um, uh, of body of work that's out there is around zone two heart rate. And the lower, the better again. The lower you can keep your heart rate for the longest period of time is what's going to set you up for a better run. And that's what the bike is all about. It's not about high power or high heart rate on the bike because that's going to put you in a really difficult position come the run, especially when it comes to the Ironman Wales run, which is notoriously tricky to, to pace and master. So that, I think zone, low zone two is probably the answer I'm going to give you. And you want to cap that. So naturally on the hills, your heart rate and power is going to spike. You're looking to spike it as little as possible. So you're looking to be smooth. You're looking for the body to be able to essentially bounce back from those little spikes really quickly. So you might just go into zone three of heart rate. That's okay. But for a very short period of time, and you want to go back into zone two as quick as possible. So how do you do that? Well, you pace it, you pace it nice and slow. You have really smooth cadence. You're seated for the majority of it. Every time you bounce out the saddle, your heart rate's going to spike up. And that also is affected by the gearing on your bike. So you can start by looking at your cassette, learn the ratios that you've got on your cassette, go to your local bike shop and ask, can I get a bigger rear cassette? By that, you'll be able to spin your legs even faster, higher cadence of the steep gradients, and that's going to keep your heart rate nice and low. And guess what? That's setting you up for a really good run later on. So gearing is actually a really important point on that. And now is the time to work out what's the biggest ratio you can get on your bike and put your ego aside. It might look silly to have a massive cassette on the back or really small chain set on the front, but you're, you're going to be laughing when you get into hour six on the bike at Ironman Wales, knowing that you protected your heart rate, you protected your legs, and then you can go and express your fitness on the run. Next question for you, Rob. Um, this is from Caroline. Do you still need electrolyte tablets or sachets, even if my mainstay of nutrition is balanced? Yeah, a great question from Caroline. Um, and I think in the answer to this, what we've got to address is the difference between daily nutrition, the food that you eat in your meals, and race and training specific fueling that you need to get through your sessions and your training and your run. So even if your nutrition on a daily basis is balanced, yes, you need to address electrolytes with the fluid that you take in during your sessions. The way to think of it is like this. If we just drink plain water, what we're effectively doing is watering down the concentration of electrolytes in our body because we're trying to replace the water and electrolytes that we lose in sweat. So if you just drink plain water, you're not replacing any of the electrolytes. The electrolytes are a key part of the hydration. So don't think of hydration as just water. Think of hydration as being water and the correct concentration of electrolytes for you. And if you think of it that way, the answer to the question is really, really obvious. You have to drink fluid that contains both water and the correct concentration of electrolytes for you. Now, if we take me as an example, I'm an incredibly salty sweater. When I was sweat tested, I lose close to 2000 milligrams of sodium in every liter of sweat that comes out of me. That's a long way of saying that if I sweated out three liters, I wouldn't just be losing three liters of water. I'd be losing 6,000 milligrams of sodium with it. So I have to replace that. Now, most people, and I'm saying most people here in the, in the middle of this curve are around the thousand milligrams per liter. So even if you, if you, if you're an average salty sweater, you're still going to be losing a thousand milligrams of sodium in every liter of sweat that goes out. 
So replacing the sodium in your training and race specific fueling is absolutely essential to making sure that you can deliver the training well and recover from the training well without being dehydrated. Okay, next question for you. Um, how would you plan other events into your program? Along the way to an Ironman, if I want to do other triathlons or other running events, how would I plan them into my program? And do I need to plan them into my program? Good question. Um, so the way that we build a training plan towards your big A race, in this case, Ironman Wales, we're going to make sure that if even if you don't do any events between now and then, you're going to be in a really good place physically to express your fitness on race day. Now, of course, Ironman Wales is a very unique course and we want you to understand the demands of the triathlon. So therefore, doing a low-key, what we'd call B or C race in the lead up to that could help you understand what a triathlon is. How do you do transitions? Where do you put your bike? Where do you put your shoes? All that stuff is also quite important when you come to race day. So although we don't need you to do another triathlon before Ironman race day, it could make sense for someone that's never done a triathlon to actually go through that process. What could be really useful is doing a triathlon that is nowhere near as demanding as something like Ironman Wales. So we're looking at a sprint, an Olympic, or maybe a 70.3, depending on your experience. And the idea behind that is you get through the process of doing a triathlon, so you're going to increase your knowledge and experience there, but it's not going to deviate you from the original plan of how we're training you. So if you do too much, if you do a big event, you're going to need a bit of a mini taper where we're reducing your um, fatigue levels pre-event, and then there's going to be a recovery period afterwards. And suddenly you're looking at a two-week period where actually we haven't been pushing you towards that overall fitness goal that we've got for Ironman Wales. So as a general rule, keep the last four weeks as totally clear. No events in that period because we're going to really hone in on how to prepare for Ironman Wales there. But in six weeks out, eight weeks out, sure, sign up to an Olympic. That, I think that would be a good starting point. And then from there, it's a great place for you to be testing your nutrition, your hydration, all your kit. So whatever you're going to be using on Ironman race day, make sure you use it in this preparation race. And also go into it knowing that you're carrying some fatigue, absolutely no pressure, smile on your face. Basically, it's a supported training day. That's the way to approach these kinds of races as opposed to really throwing everything into it. Next question for you, Rob. This is from Jake. I'm going on a cycling holiday in April. Probably will end up doing 14 to 16 hours of hilly riding. Is this stupid? And how would you recommend on recovering? Yeah, well, first up, Jake, no, it's not stupid. It sounds absolutely awesome. And Chris and I would like to come with you. That's the first starting point. <laughs> going away for a a week away of cycling focused training is a brilliant way to give your body some aerobic overload to really give you fitness level a bump. And the key part of it is to make sure you recover from it afterwards. So 14 to 16 hours of riding in a week is, is going to be fine as long as you're prepared for that. We've seen athletes do even more riding than that within a week. But the key is it's how you approach the rides when you're out there and it's how you approach the recovery afterwards. The more specific you make these rides to your Ironman, the better, which means we want the majority of the rides to be mainly aerobic, able to hold conversations with the people you're riding with. Sure, there might be some sustained efforts on the climbs, but what you don't want to get into is the kind of rides every day where you're smashing yourself to pieces as hard as you possibly can. There's really, really high intensity efforts all the time and you feel absolutely ruined when you get back. The more of the higher intensity stuff, the less of the volume you're going to be able to absorb. So it's firstly about thinking about and planning out the kind of rides that you're going to do. And then secondly, plan the recovery into the week when you get back. So typically with our athletes, when we go away and we do our, our springtime training camps, what we'll say to people is we'll look at sort of a, a three-day recovery period after athletes get back where there's no intensity in the training, 
where we get a feel for how people are recovering. And then we ease people back into the normal training there. And, and usually three days where a coach has been keeping an eye on you is enough to get you back rolling onto your normal training plan. Now, the caveat here is our athletes have got coaches keeping an eye on them and massively discouraging any kind of silly fun and games out on the road where too much high intensity work is going on. And we're able to say to an athlete, look, I think, I think you went a bit too hard yesterday. Let's move you down a group today. Let's ease up today on the, on the power and the pace so that you can train again tomorrow. Okay, so as long as you've got that approach in your head and your training mates also agree with that kind of approach, you'll be absolutely fine. And you'll come back from your, your week away, you'll have a nice bump in your fitness, you're ready to take your training on to the next level. Oh, it sounds nice, doesn't it, Chris, getting away for a week on the bike? That sounds awesome. Our next question for you. Here we go. Um, Josh K says, would hill climbs on a platform like Zwift be effective for practicing climbing? My answer here is going to come across as quite brutal, and I don't intend that to be the case. But initially, my gut is saying, please get out on the roads when it's safe. So now we're in the middle of January and there's potential ice on the roads. This is a perfect time to use something like Zwift. And yes, if you're doing Ironman Wales, head towards a hilly route if you're just riding around on Zwift. But I want to be really clear that the more time you can spend outside on your bike, on roads that are similar to the ones that you'll be racing on in Wales, the better athlete you'll be come race day. There's corners, potholes, riding uphill, riding downhill. How do you pace that nutrition, navigation? All of that is stuff that you're going to need on race day. And you can't blag that, that there is a learning phase that you need to go through. So as soon as it's safe in terms of ice on the roads, weather and all that stuff, please Aim to be outside as your plan A and plan B when safety becomes an issue is get on Zwift or similar. And yes, riding up hills again with the same premise of be smooth, keep cadence nice and light and high, um, be looking to not spike your power or your heart rate and keeping your heart rate in zone two for the vast, vast, vast majority of the time is your aim. Occasionally it's going to go into zone three when there's a very steep incline but try your aim is to bring it back down into zone two as quick as you can next question for you rob is from dan what are your thoughts on a long ride followed by a long run the morning after Okay, so in general, I'm really going to encourage people to stay away from the idea of doing your long run the day after your long ride, except for some very specific circumstances. In an ideal world, you'll separate out the long run from the long ride, and you'll have your long run in the middle of the week and your long ride at the weekend so that you reduce the risk of injury, illness, and niggles as much as you possibly can. We want to avoid you, especially in the early days, running on really, really tired legs. And we want to get the highest quality long run possible done, recover from it, and then have you do the best quality long ride that we can do. For athletes who struggle to have the time to do the long run in the middle of the week, I'll encourage you to do the long run on the Saturday and the long ride on the Sunday, because having tired legs for the long ride is actually very good practice for Ironman race day. And also, there's very low risk of injury. Swap it the other way around. And if you're very tired, sore and stiff from a long ride and you're trying to do a long run, that's when you're at the biggest danger of picking up a niggle or an injury. And that's the thing that's going to derail your training. Now, the caveat here is at one or two points towards the end of our training plan, we will have our athletes do a long ride the day after the long, sorry, a long run the day after the long ride. But that's under very specific circumstances. That's under coach supervision. For the, for the athletes who are listening who are self-coached, I'd encourage you to have your long run the day before your long ride and then a short brick run off the bike. And that's the safest way that you can train yourselves if you're not being coached by somebody. All right, Chris, next question for you. What are your thoughts around entering sprint or Olympic distance races 
in the lead up to Ironman Wales? I think we touched on this in a previous um, in a previous question, but I think Wales is going to be the same. Where it depends on the athlete, but if you can go through the process of doing a triathlon, that's not going to totally fatigue you to the point of not being able to train the next day or the next day after that, then it can be seen as a real positive because you're able to go through the triathlon process where there's a lot to learn. Uh, and you're also able to practice your pacing, your nutrition, your hydration, or your race kit. So all of that is really good. I'd avoid doing that when you get too close to the event. So keep the last four weeks really clean of any of those events. And also keep in mind that if you're training with us, then there'll be no real specific need physically to do them because you'll be doing what we call our race sim weekends, which is essentially doing a really specific homemade version of an Ironman under our supervision with specific goals within that. And that's, that's really the weekend that's make or break in terms of getting you ready for that Ironman event. So you don't necessarily need to do one. Don't panic if you ask around and everyone's saying you have to, you have to. You don't necessarily have to. As long as the training plan is setting you up for a really good Ironman day, then follow the training plan as close as you can. Here we've got a question from Carrie Ann. I am a member of a triathlon club. We have track sessions and swift swim sessions. Is it advised to do these club sessions? What do you think, Rob? Yeah, so there's there's two parts to this. Firstly, with a, a tri club swim session, I think these were a brilliant idea. If you can get into the water with a qualified and experienced coach to look at your stroke, that is by far the best way that you're going to make progress with your swim stroke. And it's also great from the point of view of getting in a pool with other triathletes who are training in a focused environment. I think any British triathlon qualified coach is going to put on a really good high quality swim session that's going to include drills, it's going to include endurance work, it's going to include threshold work at the appropriate times of year. So by all means, I totally encourage athletes to get into those sessions as long as they're run by qualified and experienced coaches. Now, my advice for tri-club track sessions, specifically for athletes who are doing Ironman, is very different. The track sessions that triathletes, um, so the track sessions that tri club coaches tend to put on are good sessions for people who want threshold running and higher, but that's not necessarily the kind of session that you want as an athlete training for an Ironman. And I would encourage, I, I encourage all the athletes we coach to stay well away from threshold running and harder in their training for this, simply because it is not specific at all for the demands of your race day for Ironman, and it carries the highest risk of injury, illness, and niggles. So you're much better off using your limited training time doing run sessions that are specific to your Ironman race day rather than going along to a session where you're going to be forced to run really hard because that is the session that's going to give you sore calves the next day or for the next three days. That's the session that is going to give you the highest risk of picking up a niggle and it's the least specific session for your training. So if you're going really, really hard and it takes you 24 to 36 hours to recover for very little specific fitness gain with regards to your Ironman, you've got to be questioning why you're going to choose to go and do that. Okay. So my advice would be stay away from track sessions for running. Absolutely go for the pool sessions for swimming. Okay. Next question for you, Chris. Mark L says, what would be the best way to tailor it to do a long endurance day on my day off? Because my day off from work changes every week. So how am I, how am I best fitting this in around the fact that my day off every week changes what day of the week it is? I think this goes back to uh, an interesting point where we were talking about recovery being at the absolute forefront of everything, every decision that we make around a training plan. So I think this is going to help Mark with his version of a training plan. If your daily or your weekly routine is never the same, the same principle can still apply. So you look at that week and you say, right, this is where I need to build in my recovery because this is where my day off is. And that's usually where I'm going to be doing my long ride or my long run, for example. So you start with the recovery 
And then you look back at building uh, fatigue and sessions around that recovery without compromising that recovery at any point. You don't touch that. Once it's in, it's in. Even if you have to miss some sessions earlier in that week for whatever reason, you still don't touch that recovery because that has to be um, in there right in the middle of it, week in, week out. So my advice to you is start with the recovery and you can also use metrics that we use with our athletes, such as HRV. Um, and so that is, again, another really good metric to understand what's um, happening in terms of your fatigue levels and your readiness to take on either big volume or high intensity. And if you use that as a guiding principle, you're also going to protect yourself um, away from too much fatigues at the wrong time. So HRV and also protecting that recovery day is an absolute must. This question for you, Rob, is from Owain. Um, is it possible to still, tr to, sorry, let me repeat that. Is it possible to still try and diet to lose weight during the winter build phase? Okay, so dieting, the idea of dieting to lose weight is always a, it's always a hot potato, if you'll forgive the pun. Um, so what I'm going to say to Owen is, the answer is going to entirely depend on you and your background. And I don't know enough about an individual athlete to give individual advice to you. But in general, what I'm going to say here is for athletes who want to change their body composition and, and reduce a bit of body fat that they're carrying, there's usually some easy wins that you can do that don't have to involve mentally thinking, I am now on a diet, because that tends to affect everything we eat in every meal. I think the easiest wins for people who want to change the body composition for an athletic performance point of view are, and unfortunately, you know, this, this is not going to be a very popular answer, but it's the facts. The easy wins are to reduce or completely cut out alcohol, to reduce or completely cut out the number of puddings you have after your evening meal, the number of sweets and chocolates that you eat after your evening meal. Like I said, it's not a popular answer, but it is a very factual answer. For most people, just addressing what you have in the evenings after your evening meal is going to go a really long way to helping you change your body type. And from there, or not your body type, but your body composition, from there, you can start to look at what you're eating within each individual meal. But that's the easy wins right there. It's not having puddings. It's not drinking alcohol. It's not having chocolates and sweets in the evenings after your evening meal. Now with the athletes we coach, we address the the day-to-day -day fueling and nutrition by having meal plans written by an expert. So we know that on a recovery day, athletes are eating recovery focused meals with higher protein content. The night before a really big endurance day, they're having meals that have got higher carbohydrate content. So they're ready and well fueled the next day. So that's the next place to start is finding a good source of reliable information about the nutrients and the food that athletes need to eat. We've taken care of it with our athletes that we coach by working with Alan Murchison at The Performance Chef. So people can go and check his website out. His stuff is absolutely brilliant. But the easy starting point is not to revamp every single meal that you have. Start with just reducing or cutting down the things that you have after your evening meal and just see how your body then reacts across a two to four week period before changing anything else. Next question for you, Chris, is from Simon B. The question is, what's your advice if you miss or, on, or are unable to train twice or once or twice or more in a week? So what do you do if you miss a couple of training sessions in the week? So the way I'm going to answer this is explain what we do with our athletes and then the athlete listening can maybe take away some of that as their principle. So we use what we call um, key sessions, and they're the sessions that we're putting right at the top of the priority list, and we want you to fight to get that session done. That might mean compromising other things in life, social life, going out, whatever it is, because we know that if even if you just do the key sessions, you're going to be in a pretty good position to take on that massive goal at the end of the year. So that's going to be the main ones. Then after that, we have supporting sessions that are on top of the key sessions and they're supporting it. So they're the ones that 
sometimes you're going to have to miss. Life does get in the way. We totally understand that. That's okay. The first thing is don't stress and don't look to be cramming that in on any other specific day. You might have an extra day off, totally off. Hey, guess what? You're going to come back to the key sessions even fresher and even more motivated to give 100% to that session. That's okay. Where things start to get really difficult is when an athlete misses one or two sessions and then they think, oh, I won't even tell my coach. I'll just tag on my run to that bike. I'll just move that swim just before my key bike. And then suddenly you're having huge spikes in fatigue. And for a week, you might find that that's okay. But we know that the impact is coming one week, two weeks, maybe even three weeks after. So you have to be really disciplined. And that's, I think, as coaches, that's some of the value we can really bring to an athlete is sometimes just saying, it's okay. Just move away. Once that session has been done or missed, leave it there. Whatever happened, leave it there, move on, see what the next session is. So you're always juggling what's the key session, what's the supporting session, how do I prioritize the key session? Anything over that is a bonus. But at no point we want you to stress and think, oh, I'm going to have to start cramming in sessions. Next question for you, Rob, is from Ed who says, I am a member of a triathlon club. Would you suggest I join their cycling rides outdoors? Yeah, so in in reference to these, these group cycling rides, I think when we clarified with Ed, he was talking about the Sunday group ride that his, that his club go out on. And the answer's in two parts. But the guiding principle of this is, the closer that you get to your goal Ironman race, the more specific you want to make the training sessions. And so in the case of the key ride, your key long ride, the closer you get to your Ironman, the more important it is that that ride is, if not on your own, certainly not riding surrounded by a group and drafting people because you have to be confident you can ride 180K under your own steam, as it were. Now, some of our athletes arrange with one or two or three other friends to go out for very specific, you know, we're doing 180K today, here's our route. If we're relatively similar strengths on the bike, we can ride 10, 20, 30 meters apart. We cross over and we have a little chat for a minute or two, and then we go back to riding 30, 40, 50 meters apart. So everyone's covering the same kind of ground, but they're not riding along in a pack. I think the challenge of the group tri ride tends to be it's two abreast, it's 10 or 12 people long, people are riding along and having a chat. And, you know, while there's some value to the social side of that, especially in the early days of your, of your training, I think the closer to the ride, so the closer to race day you get, the more you want to be really clear that you can do this ride under your own steam. So in summary, yes, in the early days, closer you get to race day, the more you want to be training under your own steam. And final question for you, Chris, is from Robert P. He says, is it a good idea to train with the gel or food provider that Ironman Wales is going to use or that the Ironman that you're doing is going to use? Should I train with the nutrition products that will be available on the course. 100%. So what we said earlier in this conversation is that it's been proven that it takes athletes eight to 10 weeks on average to train their gut to be able to absorb the nutrition that you're asking it to on race day. So if you don't do that with the specific nutrition brands that you're actually being provided on race day, then you're taking a huge risk and basically crossing your fingers whether you're going to be able to absorb it and not get GI issues on the day. We, we don't want to be doing that. So what you want to do is find out which brand your Ironman is most likely to be providing, and then you feature that as part of your training cycle and use those products as much as you can in the lead up to the event. You can also use your own products, so from different brands, to supplement but you don't just want to turn up on race day thinking, oh, I've never even tried that gel. Should I try it? The answer is, if you're in desperate need, probably, but you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So you want to try it and test it multiple, multiple, multiple times under race intensity, under fatigue, under stress. And then you're going to be in a really good, confident position and you know how everything's going to feel. So yes, please practice the race day nutrition that you're going to be using on race day. 
Oh, Rob, it feels as if I've just finished an exam. Woo! You've done it, mate. Tick in the box. Well done. All right, so listen, for the, for the audience listening, I genuinely hope that some of these questions have, have really helped you out. Even if nothing else, if you've heard a question and gone, oh, I had that question, or if you heard a question and thought, I'd never even thought about, I'd never even thought about going for a swim in the sea ahead of race day. It's the right questions to be asking yourself, you know, a distance of time out away from your Ironman race. You've got loads of time to take care of these, these mistakes that people have had. Guiding principle here is the more prepared you are for your event, the more, the higher your chances of success are going to be come race day. And I just discourage you from being that person who, who enters the event and says, do you know what? I've never done any, I've never done any kind of triathlon or any kind of endurance event before. My question to that person would be, well, why not? Why have you not used some of the time? And did you enter yesterday? You know? Why not use some of the time in the lead up to be as prepared as you possibly can? So I hope that it's helped people out. All right, so we'll wrap this show up here today. Thank you very much for listening. And here are some discount codes and deals for you over at precisionfuelandhydration.com. You can use the code OXYGEN24 for 15% off your first electrolyte order. Chris talked there in one of his answers about you know the importance of you getting a handle on your own carbohydrate needs, your own fluid needs, and your own electrolyte needs. If you go to their website, you can use the free fuel and hydration planning tool, and it'll actually give you your own personalized strategy for training. You can try it out in training and then refine it. And by the time race day comes around, it'll be really, really easy. Even there's an option on there. You can book a free one-to-one -one video consultation call with PFNH's athlete support team. There's a link for this in the show notes. You can have a one-to-one -one call for 20 minutes and they'll help you nail your nutrition and electrolyte plan. So there will be no guessing for you come race day. And listen over at teamoxygenetic.com. I think we've got the most comprehensive endurance sports coaching program for busy age groupers. If you're looking for help and advice with your training for an Ironman this year or a 70.3 this year, please, we encourage you to book a call with us and see if you'd be a good fit for joining Team Oxygen Addict. And let's see how we can best help you achieve your endurance event goals for the coming season. Right. There's links in the show notes. So you don't have to remember them to go to both precision fuel and hydration and also to go to teamoxygenetic.com. Click those and hopefully between the two of us, we can help you out. Until next week, have a great safe training and racing week. I'm coach Rob Wilby and you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict podcast. 